film is presented to acquaint you with the flight capabilities of the FJ-2 Fury air superiority fighter. You'll learn about its airspeed and Mach number limits, load factor limits, and specific handling characteristics. But first, let's get squared away on terms. We'll be talking about Mach number, which, as you know, is a percentage of the speed of sound. We refer to Mach number because unusual handling characteristics may occur at the same Mach meter reading, regardless of altitude. However, indicated airspeed is something else. For instance, if you climb at a constant Mach 0.8, your indicated airspeed will be highest at low altitude and decrease until it is lowest at high altitude. Your airspeed Mach meter is designed so that the single pointer will always indicate airspeed and also the equivalent Mach number in the higher speed ranges. The Mach scale is geared to compensate for combinations of airspeed and temperature. Get used to this instrument. You'll have to think in terms of Mach number as well as indicated airspeed to properly understand your airplane. You'll also be flying with a problem called compressibility, and this means a rapid buildup of drag on the airplane at high speed. Even at high subsonic speeds, air traveling over wings and tail reaches supersonic velocities because of the greater distance it must travel over surface curvature. The FJ-2's swept back design delays the adverse effects of compressibility, but has not completely eliminated them. This is the reason the clean airplane is limited to 592 knots, or whenever wing roll becomes excessive, whichever occurs first. The airplane's tendency to drop a wing at transonic speed is dangerous close to the ground and difficult to correct. So when you're down near the deck, watch for this tendency. Be prepared to slow down if wing roll becomes difficult to handle. However, at altitude where air density is low, wing roll is only mildly noticeable and quickly brought under control. Above 15,000 feet, there is no need to worry about airspeed limits with or without tanks. However, when you're flying with drop tanks, either full or empty, the airspeed limit below 15,000 feet is 560 knots, or Mach 0.93, whichever is lower. Rapid response to controls is one of the most outstanding characteristics of this airplane. You'll find your FJ-2 responsive to aileron and elevator throughout its normal speed range. Control forces are always comfortable and, in fact, are extremely light under most circumstances. If you set up for a dive and trim for hands-off flight, indicating Mach 0.85 at about 10,000 feet, and then build up to limit speed, push forces on the stick will gradually increase up to 14 pounds. At 30,000 feet, still trimmed at Mach 0.85, push forces build to only 10 pounds as you increase speed up to and beyond Mach 1. Then, in a 6.5 G pullout at 10,000 feet, trimmed at Mach 0.85, pull forces won't exceed 25 pounds. With the same trim at 30,000 feet, where you can get about 4 G before a stall, you'll be pulling back just 16 pounds on the stick. So you see, this airplane is highly responsive to control and requires only a minimum of pilot effort. You don't have to pull many pounds at low altitude to bring your airplane past the six and one half G limit. Until you're thoroughly used to the way the FJ-2 handles, go easy. Get the feel before you try close-in formation work or any violent maneuvers. This degree of controllability in the FJ-2 
is due specifically to a hydraulic power system operating ailerons, controllable stabilizer, and elevator. The rudder is manually actuated. Working with this hydraulic power system is your controllable stabilizer, which furnishes a large effective control surface, thereby making it physically possible to maneuver at very high speeds. In the past, conventionally controlled airplanes were drastically limited in this respect. Conventional elevators became useless in the high Mach number range. Separation of airflow and shock waves resulted in severe buffet. In extreme cases, airplanes were not able to make low altitude pullouts after controls had lost effectiveness in a dive from high altitude. The FJ-2's controllable stabilizer attacks the problem like this. The entire stabilizer is a working control surface. It is, in effect, a large elevator handling air loads from leading edge to trailing edge. At high speeds, where there is little stabilizer deflection, mechanical linkage keeps elevators in trail. But at low speed, with large stabilizer deflections, the linkage increases elevator movement with respect to stabilizer position. You can see that with a large control surface like this, you're certain to get instant and positive response. The ailerons are also operated by the same hydraulic power flight control system. You will experience smooth lateral stick control forces, which are independent of airspeed, altitude, and G-loading throughout the normal flight range. And while we're talking about controls, remember this airplane requires very little rudder. In high-speed maneuvering, it's almost unnecessary. And in a gunnery run, you have to go very easy with rudder, or your fire will skid off the target. Now let's have a look at the specific handling qualities this FJ-2 airplane possesses. In a climb, you'll notice that aileron sensitivity increases as you go up in altitude. When you're leveled out and get into the speed range between Mach 0.85 and Mach 0.95, the only control variation you'll need is a slight increase in push force to offset a nose-up tendency and to maintain level flight. The majority of the time, you'll probably be operating at high Mach numbers, particularly in a combat area. And at altitude, handling characteristics as concerns roll, pitch, and yaw are good. But remember, in high-speed flight, your responsive stabilizer will react extremely fast to small fore and aft movements of the stick. You've got to go easy with pitch control, or you may induce an oscillation which could be dangerous close to the ground. So if you experience this oscillation at any altitude, merely release stick pressure, and your airplane will stabilize itself. When you check out your FJ-2, you will find the stall mild and recovery easily affected. In general, there will be no excessive roll or yaw, but you will find that it enters a stall at a high angle of attack. Rudder and airplane buffet will always give you ample warning to release back pressure and recover. With idling power in a straight ahead stall, you'll fall straight through with a slight pitching motion. With power, your nose drops and there is a mild rolling tendency, which can be adequately controlled with aileron. And this brings us to stalls out of turns and pull-ups where you'll be pulling some G. At low speed, you get fairly heavy buffet before your nose drops out of the turn. You'll lose a few hundred feet before recovering. Then, in a high-speed stall, you're warned by heavy buffet before a wing drops sharply or you snap roll. You can lose about a thousand feet out of a high-speed stall. Respect the stall warning heavy buffet gives you and avoid over-control. There is adequate availability of control to correct a mistake before you stall. A discussion of flight capabilities would be incomplete without an explanation of G-limits. 
With empty tanks or with a clean airplane, G limits are identical. The red line in normal pull-ups is 6.5 G. In rolling pull-ups, the limit is reduced to 5.2 G. And negative limit is minus 3 G. When you have fuel in your tanks, all your G limits are further reduced. In normal pull-ups, your limit is down to 5.2 G. In rolling pull-ups, the red line is lowered to 4.2 G. And the negative limit is minus 1 G. Of course, ultimate design limitations assure you a safety factor over red line G limits. But never use this safety factor except as a survival tactic. Structural deformation may result if you push the airplane past red line G. However, we know that it's very possible to unwittingly exceed six and one half G out of an abrupt pull up or a tight turn, particularly at low altitude. And the airplane has a tendency to overshoot under some high speed conditions. Overshoot can only occur within what is called the buffet boundary or at the G load where you feel a distinct increase in airplane vibration. Overshoot is dangerous, but if you heed the increase of buffet during high speed maneuvers, you can correct quickly and easily. Let's say you're pushed over in a steep dive and you begin a sharp recovery intending to pull about 5G. There'll be a normal amount of fairly heavy buffet. And at this point, the airplane may tend to tighten the pull up all by itself. G builds rapidly. You'll feel a pronounced increase in buffet. And if you fail to release back pressure and correct, the airplane can overshoot dangerously, perhaps to the point of critical deformation or failure. Overshoot tendencies occur between 15 and 25,000 feet and at speeds between Mach 0.82 and 0.94 and always because of sharp maneuvering while in the buffet region. This does not mean you can't fly in the buffet region. It does mean that you should not continue to tighten a turn or a pull up while the airplane is buffeting. Buffet itself imposes no limitation except that every pilot must know at what point to expect a stall or at what point overshoot could occur. Remember this too about overshoot. If you pop speed brakes in a high speed pull up, anticipate the slight increase in G they will give you. Always think ahead. You can learn this by study and practice. Check over the VN diagrams in your flight handbook. Here on paper are the operating flight limits of the airplane. Learn the capabilities and then go aloft and practice. Get the feel of buffet and stall at various altitudes. Train yourself to fly safely in the buffet region. Now let's take a close look at those VN diagrams and cover each item point by point. Using the combat weight of the FJ-2, approximately 16,500 pounds, the VN diagram for 10,000 feet looks like this. Each line has a meaning. This line stands for indicated airspeed. This line for G. This line is for maximum allowable G. This or maximum attainable speed of the airplane. This is the buffet area. And this all important stall line is determined by combinations of speed and G. Diagrams change shape with altitude, becoming progressively smaller as you go up due to the decreasing amount of G and indicated airspeed you can attain at high altitude. So you can get a better picture of these various operational limits. Imagine the VN diagram for each altitude as a separate island in the sky. At 10,000 feet, your operational island will be shaped something like this. Pretty large, lots of room to get around. And the real estate here is friendly enough, not too cloudy with Buffett. But the red line mountains look rugged. 
and beyond, a dangerous looking area. Not very healthy flying country across there. Seems all right on this side of the mountains though. So let's fly on at about Mach point five and do a little air work. Try a pull up, a sharp one. Build some G. That's it. You get into Buffett at about four G, mild, and when you reach five G, you stall out. No trouble at that speed, but let's advance the throttle. And when you're pushing Mach point nine, pull her up again. Mild Buffett at about five and a half G. Six, hold it. Six and a half is the limit. Hold it. Keep your eye on the accelerometer. You've got plenty of operational room without getting into trouble on the wrong side of Red Line Mountains. Let's get a little more altitude. On 20,000 foot island, you'll find the place fairly representative of the islands between 15 and 25,000 feet. In this range, overshoot can be serious unless you correct quickly. Take a flyer at this island, throttle up to Mach point nine and pull up sharply. Buffett will come in at about three and a half G and begin to build as you tighten the maneuver. Now start to watch it. Four and a half, five G. Feel the Buffett increase? Start your recovery now before overshoot sends you beyond the six and a half G limit. That's right. Always lead your recovery in a steep turn or a rapid pull up at this altitude. Now let's see what 30,000 foot island looks like. Getting smaller now, but there's still plenty of room for maneuvering. And there is no danger connected with overshoot here. You just can't pull enough G. Notice the buffet region. You're not going to get very much or very strong buffet before you stall. So remember, at maximum level flight speed, 3.5 G is the most you can get out of the airplane. At 40,000 feet, your operational island is smaller still. Of course, it's great for flat out speed, but you can't pull the nose up sharp or bend over hard in a turn. A little better than 2 G at Mach point nine is all you can get at this altitude without a stall. Buffett won't give you very much stall warning up here. So practice pulling the maximum obtainable G in this thin air. Fly in the Buffett region and get the feel of just how far you can go with a turn or a pull up. A stall in combat can be a fatal mistake. Study and remember the characteristics of these basic VN islands in the sky. They are the characteristics of your airplane. Naturally, there are other intermediate islands, one for every altitude. Dig into the VN diagrams in your handbook. You'll emerge a wiser pilot armed with every fundamental concerning the strength and performance of your FJ-2. And now let's see if you've got the word on all the information we've covered. First of all, you're flying an airplane that is responsive on the controls. It will give you high speed, good maneuverability, and a wide operational range. At altitude, with or without drop tanks, you won't be concerned with airspeed limits. But as you get down near the deck in a clean airplane, remember you're redlined at 592 knots. Below 15,000 feet with tanks, the limit is 560 knots or Mach 0.93, whichever is lower. And remember the airplane's wing roll tendency. It comes in about Mach 0.95 and is easily controllable at altitude but harder to handle and dangerous down on the deck. Watch your airspeed red lines. Stay with them. Availability of control is one quality the airplane has at all altitudes and airspeeds, but you have to beware of over controlling, especially at low altitude where you don't have to come back very hard on the stick to exceed red line G. Right here, let's make a quick review of G limits. With a clean airplane or with empty tanks, six and a half G. But with any fuel in the tanks, it's 5.2 G. Rolling pull-ups in the clean airplane or with empty tanks, 5.2 G. And with fuel in the tanks, hold a rolling pull-up to 4.2 G. 
The negative G limit is minus three in a clean airplane or with empty tanks. With full tanks, minus one G. Remember these limits, they're important. So that's it, the basic capabilities of your FJ2 Fury. Now, it's up to you. Work with your airplane and the flight handbook. Study, practice. Make yourself an integral part of the Fury's flying qualities. And you're on your way to the kind of precision work that spells combat readiness. <laughs>